All right, and、um, this lecture will be talk about adjoints of linear maps and self-adjoint operators. Okay, and you know in the first half of linear algebra, right? There's two parts of linear algebra. First part is studying the linear maps between vector spaces, and the other half is about、uh, the matrices, the matrix calculations. Right, and there are some、um, relation that is between them. Right, there's some relation. Be- there's some connection between them. Right, and now we discover if the vector space is an inner product space, and we're gonna still study the relation between them. If the vector space equipped it with an inner product, right. So, first is a proposition, which is or our definition is that. Well, given two inner product spaces, okay, two inner product spaces such that they're both finite dimensional, both finite dimensional, and for T an op linear map between V to W, there exists a T star. That's a linear map from W to V, such that for any V and V for any W W we have this equality. So basically, T V W. With inner product in W is the same as the V here, the V here, but the W with the T star W, and the inner product is in V. Okay, so there exist. There exist should be a unique one. There exists a unique. Another linear map such that, for any V and W, we have this inequality. Okay, so, um. This T is a joint of T. We call T star. We call T star the adjoint of T. Okay, which is T. T V W is same as V and T star W. Okay. And to prove this, we first need to prove that the T star exists. As a function, so such function exists. Okay, our first step is to prove that it is a function. Okay, and to prove it, um,、uh, now, for T and、uh, a linear map, right? We fix W. Then we consider the linear function that takes V to T V W. Okay, take V to T V W. So W is fixed. For each fixed W, we have a linear function associated. Such that is mapped to V to T V W in the bar and W, and it's easy to check it's linear, and by Ray's representation theorem, we know that any linear functional. Any linear functional, the first half right, is equal to a map that takes V, to V V prime some V prime for some unique V prime in V, this is the first half of. Raised representation theorem is that for any phi in the linear functional, phi v exists unique u such that phi v is equal to v u for any v. Okay. This is the statement of the first half of raised representation theorem. Right, any linear functional can be rep- represented as an inner product. Right, so. This is a linear, a、uh, linear functional, right? It takes a vector v to a field. Now, this map is same as take v to this for some unique v prime. The v prime is our u, right? Now note that this v prime depends on w. We fix w, and then we have the associated v prime,、okay? and this also depends on t, right? So we let t star w equals to this v prime. Hence, we have t v w is equal to v t star w for any v. Right, and okay, we fix w right now, and we have a unique t prime, or a a unique, we have a unique t star w. Right, t star w is in v. Right, and now let let w be arbitrary. For each w. If w is arbitrary, and we repeat the above argument, right? We repeat the above mar- argument. 
then we associated an another v prime. Hence, we have a map that takes w. Is that we fix w? We take w to a map to t star v. T star v. T star w. I'm sorry. T star w. So hence, it's a function, right? Because why is a function? Because the v prime is uniquely determined, right? If you think about it. For each for each w, we have a t star w that is unique. Right. Right. So we have a map that is unique. So such t star exists as a function. Right? Exists as a function. Okay. Now we have to show that t star is linear. To show that it's linear, it is kind of routine work, and I leave for you to check about this, right? Tv of w1 plus w2 is equal to t star of w1 plus w2, right? This is uh, a joint definition. And tvw1 plus tvw2, right? We split it, and then we we, we split, uh, we, uh, we use the joint thing, right? And now we regroup it again, right? Which means that v of this is equal to v with this. So these two are equal because it's for any v. If it's for any v, right? And the scalar is the same thing. Just notice that we move out, we should take the conjugate, right? And we move in, we should take it back. So we good, right? Okay. And notice the importance of letting v and w to be finite dimensional, right? Um, is that, well, let's look at the race representation theorem uh, here, right? The race representation states that the dimension v should be finite. You see? Dimension v should be finite, okay? The dimension of v should be finite. The, the is a linear functional, right? The space should be the functional space, the same as dimension of v, but dimension of v should be finite. So our here, right? Our dimension of v is finite. And to let dimension w to be finite, um, like you could let it be infinite because it doesn't affect anything, right? But our main focus is the operators, the set of operators instead of v w. Right, so if we, if we let v to be finite, then the w is equal to v, right? If it's operators, then w should... Like, it just, just it's down to the earth. Just don't think about the general cases because we're not going to do it, right? We're not going to study about it. Like we, we're going to focus on finite dimensional linear operators, okay? So, 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 so. Mm. Some remarks. So with the same notation as above we have this property. S plus T star is S star plus T star. And the verification is as below, right? I also just walk through this really quick. Mm, this is equal to V S plus T star. It is equal to this is equal to S T V. You flip it, you flip it and V here, we remove this, and this is equal to what? S plus T star W, right? And the scalar, right? Lambda of T star equals to lambda bar T star for any lambda and K, okay? And this is also very easy to verify, right? You take this, right? Lambda is equal to lambda conjugate conjugate, right? You take two times the conjugate, and you if you move it back, you should take one conjugate out. Right. Okay. Mm. And notice that um, if if we have k is equal to r, right? If k is equal to r, then we send t to t star is a linear map. Right. It's a linear map. This that gives this. This gives lambda t star. But so the map that takes t to t star is a linear map on 
is loading the map on operators on the operators, right? Yeah, it is a linear map between the operators, right? Okay. And uh, T star star, is, uh, you star star twice, it goes back to itself because T star W V, right? Is equal to T star star V W, right? That's we flip it, we add a conjugate, and we use the joint definition here, and then we flip it back. So we have WTV is with WT star star V, right? So they're equal. And S T star is equal to T star S star. Um, well, this is also easy to verify. For any S from W to U, where U and uh, is a finite dimensional inner product space. Right, so from here, right, W to U, S is a learning math from W to U, right? So here, we also need to need W to be a finite dimensional, right? Which agrees with our, like, here, right? We just, we just let the domain and codomain both be finite dimensional, so it simplifies, right? Because we don't really consider much about the in, like, in this course. So, um yeah basically you could verify this equality so st s of t is is a linear math from v to w uh v to u right so v u and you just boom boom and use the adjoint definition right s you get a, get a joint of s and t you again get a joint of t and this is equal to this so u this okay and the adjoint of i is equal to itself. Right. It's easy to verify this, right? And if t is invertible, then the joint is invertible. And we have this equation. Okay, first, if t is invertible, then t star, so this star is equal to what? t star and t negative one star is equal to i star is equal to i, right? And t, t negative one i, you take star, which gives this, right, t one star and t star, right, is from this equation, right? t negative one star, t star, composition gives you i back. So you see that um, the inverse of this is equal to this one, which is t inverse star. Right? You see. Right? Yeah. So again, I mentioned this already. If k is equal to r, then this is linear by a and b. And now we're going to study the kernel and range of the joint uh, uh, a joint map. So, um, the kernel of t star is the range of t, the range t perp. Okay, it's just, curve T star is the range T perp. Why? Because if W is in curve T star, if and only if T star W is equal to ZV, zero V, right? If this is true, then V and this is equal to zero for any V, right? Which means that T V W is equal to zero for any V, right? Which means that for this W, for this W, an inner product with T V for any V is zero, which means that W belongs to the perp of range T. And the reverse direction is left for you to verify, right? And range of T is equal to curve T perp. Well, this is very easy because notice this, we, we take perp twice. That gives you range range t and this gives you curve t perp, right? And curve t is good to range t star perp. So again we note that we by a, right? By a we have this 
which means that um, cur t star, so we replace t, replace t with t star, right? So t star star, is range t star perp, but t star star it goes to cur t, right? So cur t is equal to range t star perp, and d follows that follows by well, because we have range t stars to cur t perp. Range t star, um, you see, um, sorry, range t is to cur t perp, right? We have this range t is to cur t perp, cur t star perp, cur t star perp, and we replace t with t star again, right? So range t is in the cur t perp, okay? So those are just some, some facts about the kernel and range and the orthogonal complements, right? And you see that the proofs are really simple, right? And now it's finally the time for us to relate it to matrices, okay, linear algebra. So um, for any A in matrix, M times N matrix with entries in K, um, we define the adjoint of A, or the adjoint matrix, to be equal to the conjugate transpose. You see? The conjugate transpose, right? So if K is equal to R, then the adjoint is basically equal to transpose, but if it's complex, right, it's a conjugate transpose. Okay? And why we are introducing this notion is because by this theorem, that given two, see, we require we require W to be finite dimensional so we can do matrices, right? So yeah, so now we can require W to be finite dimensional, right? So if it's inner product spaces with finite dimension, then we can have a orthonormal basis for V and W. This for V, this for W, right? Then we have well, t star is from W to V, right? Then t star of V A, the matrix of t star is equal to, so the matrix of a joint T, T a joint, is the same as the matrix of T with a joint. Okay, so this is the, some important theorem here. And all because by orthonormal basis. Right. If it's in a product finite dimensional, we have orthonormal basis by Grand Schmidt, right? And the proof is that, well, it's just by computation. Notice that T of XK, if you think about the definition of matrix, T XK should give um, the kth column, right? Yes, the kth column. But T XK is equal to this. It's from lecture 14. So lecture 14, I guess, should be this one. This is lecture 14, right? Yes. Is by, we prove this, this equality here. Given an orthonormal basis, for any V, we have this. Right, so from here, our orthonormal basis is Y. Right, so TSK is with this and plus, plus, plus this. And this is the kth column of the matrix of T, right? And which means that the kth column and the jth row, the jth row should be what? T, X, K, Y, J. Because if you think about it like that, right? You're presented as the sum of the coefficients, right? the sum of coefficients, sum of coefficients. And the jth entry should be the jth coefficient, which is the jth one, which is txkyj, right? Okay, now we finished computing this, now we compute the other side. t star of yk, which is the kth column of the adjoint map, right? The kth column, like those uh, coefficients associates the kth column of the matrix of the adjoint map. And this is, again, we use the, the equality, right? This is an orthonormal basis, right? You know, this. And which means that 
the jth row is again xj, right? Yk xj. We pick xj. Now we have t star yk xj. Right? This we take the adjoint to here, which is t star star xj, which is this. Right, by definition, right? And this we take the we flip, we take a conjugate, it's just TXJYK. TXJYK. Right? So the row J column K of this is the conjugate of what? Um, row K column J, right? As you can see. Right? Row K column J of this. So we're done. It's just by direct computation and the use of this formula. This formula is here, right? This this formula here. Okay, so we're good. Now, uh, in general, if the dimension of V is infinite, should always an operator have an adjoint? Well, the answer is no. And here's an counter example. We define R infinity finite to be the all real sequences such that there exists a cutoff such that after that is all zero, right? So basically at one, two, one, three, zero, 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 right? This should, this sequence is an R infinity finite, right? So set of all sequences such that after some point, the entries are all zero. And addition and scalar multiplication on R is defined the same as your guess, right? Just comp component-wise addition and component-wise multiplication. And well, it is definitely closed, right? As you can check. And we define their inner product to be, right? X, Y to be uh, like as in the Euclidean spaces, right? As in the Euclidean spaces. And this sum, this series is definitely convergent. It's definitely definitely convergent because it is a finite sum. Right? It's a finite sum because if x, y, they're both in infinite finite. So with this setting, we have a infinite dimension in a product space. Why is it infinite dimension? Because we have a basis, right? Uh just give me one second, all right? So if we define right v1 v in subspace which this is somehow is vn is a copy of rn sitting in this set right it's somehow a copy right a copy of rn sitting in this space right so v1 is x1 0 0 v2 is x1 x2 and vn is x1 xn 0 0 0 right and their union is this set Right, it's the ascending sequences of subspaces that it converges to our space. Okay. So, well, it is an inner product space, but why is it infinite dimensional? Well, because we have a basis that is infinite. Uh, that we have a basis that is an infinite set, right? Infinite set. A set of bases that is an infinite set. If you have V E I to be only the ith component, right? Then this is the basis for the space, right? So that's why we say it is an infinite dimensional vector space. Well, to verify this is the basis for R infinity n is really, really easy. Because right? if you think about for any elements in here, any element in here it's can be represented as a, like it's in the span of, span of this. It's easy to check. And we appraise infinity n is the basis for Vn. Right, so easy to check. Right? So with all these settings, right, we have the space here and we have the scalar multiplication and the inner product on it. Right? And we know that any linear operator can be uniquely determined by specifying its value on its basis. Right? So we define an operator t such that it's it takes and maps en, it maps basis, to the sum 
from ui to n okay so for by this definition we have a t we have an operator t and the thing is that t does not have an adjoint right so our case is not as like is like not as we thought when the vector space is infinite dimensional right t does not have an adjoint okay and to prove this of course we prove by contradiction suppose there exists an adjoint such that we have this and that right then um okay t e1 e1 is equal to e1 e1 is equal to 1 right and we let s e1 to be a sequence then these two are equal e1 and s e1 so s e1 is a sequence if you take the inner product of e1 you should think that after computation you realize that this gives you the first component the first term of the sequence which is equal to one because this is equal to one right? they're equal so on t e2 e1 is again equal to one right because one one zero 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 one zero 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 their inner product should equal to one times one plus one times zero plus zero 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 which is equal to one right but this gives the second component right this gives the second component which is equal to one but we can continue forever right t e k gives you one but this gives the k component is equal to one and boom 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 we're gonna realize that s e one gives a sequence equals to x n such that all its components are equal to one but this is not even in our space it's a contradiction because we assume that s is an operator right it takes a sequence to a sequence in this space this is by definition right but it maps to an element that is not in our space so it's a contradiction so in infinite dimension the story is different right? and we want to focus on the finite dimension because finite dimension has matrices right is that clear okay good 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 oh fantastic all right now is some extensions recall recall from last term that the dual map or the pullback so for t is a linear map from v to w we define t t num I'll call it T num, okay? T num is now from dub, the W num to V num. W num is equal to the the dual space of W. Right, such that for any learning function, it defined as this. Right, it's defined as this. Okay? And second, we define an annihilator of a subspace of, of a subset of V. So an annihilator is the set of all linear functionals such that it vanishes on the set U. So an annihilator is a subspace, right? It's a subspace of the dual space. It consists of all the functionals such that it vanishes on U. And thirdly, we have the formula for their dimensions assume that the dimension v is finite okay for this formula let's just verify this real quick okay so for any inclusion map right i star is from v star to uh, uh sorry i num is from v num u uh, u num and the kernel of this is is the same as the annihilator of u you can check this by definition i'll leave for you to check Okay, remember I star is defined as this, and the nuclear is defined of all functionals such that it vanishes on you. And we know that dimension v is equal to dimension v v num, right? So you have the rank plus the rank 
plus the null nullity is equal to dimension of v no right you replace this with this and this with this okay so you have this and for any f uh, function on u we can extend to a function on v right this is doable because our space v is finite dimension i mean okay um and i mean not necessary uh i kind of forgot but yeah this infinite dimension you can still extend oh i'm sorry you can still extend but but no matter what you can you can the extension of functional is depend on the extension of basis right yes and yeah we're in finite dimensional cases okay so so everything is lollipops and rainbows and cupcakes you know so this we can extend to this which means that we have this relation right which means that u star is equal to the range i star we, we prove this and we obviously have this right so the rank of this is equal to the dimension of u star which is the dimension of u right so we put this in so we have that this is equal to dimension v minus dimension of u Oof, yes we good we good okay so like some like this and um this and the rank dimension theorem and extension of functionals it's all like the first half of the course Okay, so I mean okay if it's finite dimensional it's so easy because for a basis of u we can extend to a basis of v right we can extend basis of v and we extend basis and we specify the values on the basis and we get another linear map right. okay and lastly we have this which, which we just proved because v is equal to the direct sum if it's direct sum the dimension is equal to the sum of their dimensions okay this again by the first part of linear algebra, right? So we see that they have the same formula, right? Also, the Ray's representation theorem is that it states that, well, if the space is finite dimensional, and for any v, we define the phi v as this, then the map that takes v to phi v is a bijection, right? So this shows that we can have a correspondence between v and um, v num in some way, but we already know that their dimension is the same in the first half of linear algebra. So like this is just another viewpoint, another point of view, right? And we relate it to inner product. Okay. So yes, the rays gives an identification of v with v, now which gives. Uh, like there are some sense the same set why because well if you think about it if uh, given any functional and annihilator right give it any functional and annihilator this functional is equal to 5v right is equal to some 5v for some v and 5v on u should give you zero right for any u and u but this means that u v is equal to zero for any u and u. And from here, we see that v is in u perp. Right. And now we go back. If v is in u perp, then we have this for any u and u. Right. Okay. And we can define a phi v, right? For any v and u perp. We have this which means that the map right we have a phi v u right which means that we have a phi v that is in a nuclear of u right so yes yes it's a correspondence right indeed by these two right if they have the same dimension, 
then they're isomorphic, right? Remember from lecture eight, I remember that it's a fantastic theorem is that any vector space, any two vector spaces, if they have the same dimension, they're isomorphic. If it's infinite dimension, they have this, they have the, their dimension has the same cardinality because you have, you can establish a, in general, you can establish a bijection, right, between their bases. And what about the pullback and the adjoint, right? With those information and the claim is that we have this, right? Okay, if we have this, uh, the, the proof is really simple. The proof is really simple. So we claim we have this, right? Well, if we have this, which means that for any functional on W, it is equal to some phi W, right? Is with some phi w. Now we apply t star on this, which gives you phi w of t, right? Phi w of t is equal to this. Right, we have this equation, right? So for any we have this is equal to this. So we have this is equal to phi w of t. Right? So we can think about well phi w of t is the same as the t gets really the t goes in the bottom with the star right t, eh, t gets so tiny right with the star right you can interpret it in this way <laughs> yeah right it's a correspondence okay so this is everything for the knowledge of a joint operators now we have a special classes of operators that is if t is equal to t a joint then T is called self-adjoint, okay? So T is self-adjoint means that this is equal to this, or the matrix is equal to like self-adjoint matrix. We can associate a notion of a classes of matrix, a matrices such that they're called self-adjoint matrices. So basically it is equal to itself, the conjugate transpose, right? Special class of matrices. Okay. Now, just some propositions. If it's self adjoint, then eigenvalues are real. So the proof is not hard to follow, right? I suppose. We just calculate TVV. We love the VV. And we self adjoint, we have VTV, right? And this is lambda V, and we pull it in front, so we have lambda to lambda bar, which means that lambda is a real number. Okay? And now we're gonna, it only holds if the field is the complex field. We have TVV is equal to zero for any v if and only if t is equal to zero okay this is not true if k is equal to r right and this is the counter example if uh, k is equal to r so this only holds if k is equal to c and the proof is that if we have okay this is like so simple so we're only going to prove this okay if we show that this is true then t is zero Right. So we want to show this is equal to zero for any u, w, and v. But this is equal to this formula. Okay, is equal to this formula. And this you expand gives you this. This you expand gives you this. Right, like if you verify, if you verify it, it's with this, and so t u w is equal to this. But this thing, it was at this, they are the same, right? So the entire thing should be equal to zero. So t u w is equal to zero for any u w and v, provided we have this. The t v v, right? Same, same, same thing, same thing, same thing, same thing, same thing, same thing. 
and this formula expanded while we verify here's the verification just a bunch of calculations and you see that boom okay okay now if the field is complex then we have a sufficient and this is sufficient condition of t being self-adjoint is that if we have this is equal to in the real number if tvv is real for any v then it is self-adjoint okay basically on uh, this you flip it and now you adjoin it back right so So T is self adjoint. Then we have this. Then we have this. Then we have this. Right, we replace this with this. Which means that TV is in there. Right? The equivalence relation holds. Okay. And lastly, finally, is like in general, right? In general, if T is self adjoint, then we have this um, equivalence. Equivalence, logical equivalence, provided that T is self adjoint. What well, can is equal to C is already done, right? When T is equal to C, if T is self adjoint, uh, somewhere here, right? Um, this, if only if T is equal to zero, right? I mean, this is without without the assumption of T being self adjoint, right? Without T, without T being self adjoint, right? T self adjoint. Like we didn't require T to be self adjoint, but if K is equal to R, we require T to be self adjoint to like this holds. Okay? And again, we have this thing, right? Because this is so simple, we only verify this direction. In this direction, we see that TUV is equal to this, right? Zero, zero. So do zero for any UV done, so T is equal to. Okay, so this concludes everything for self-adjoint operators, and from now on, we're gonna. Next time, we're gonna introduce more special classes of operators on inner product spaces. So, I'll see you guys next time.